by introducing our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Pete Coffey. Um, Pete's joining us again. He's come back to Sheffield to visit us. Uh, he was actually a group leader in this department from 1989 to 2005. And so it's really good to see that he's come back to tell us about the research which he started here at Sheffield, which he continued at the Institute of Ophthalmology at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. And he's now working down there alongside a position in uh, California at Santa Barbara using stem cells to cure blindness conditions. So I'd like to invite Pete to come to take to the stage. Thanks. Thanks, Layla. Uh, yeah, not many people would have actually invited me if they knew I was already here about 14 years. Uh, but um, it's great to be back. Uh, just wait for the switch over. Um, so yeah, I started in Sheffield in 1989 and in 2005 set out on a project which was initiated here, which was the London Project to Cure Blindness, which I'm going to tell you about tonight very quickly before the drinks. Um, uh, but one thing to add is I'm a back of the eye guy. So from the front to the back of the eye guy, guys, there are about eight specialities. We never talk to each other, so I'm a back of the eye guy, and this is where we're going to focus on. The beauty of the eye is that nice little window it has on the front, because it allows us to actually look into the back of the eye, which has all the cells that allow us to see this presentation tonight. And amazingly, it's an area which is only about 10 millimeters in diameter, which contains all the components which allow us to see in color, allow us to read, allow us to recognize faces, etc. And an even smaller area where the whole of the, our world is focused, which is a, a region called the fovea, which is about a millimeter. So the whole of our world is focused on that area. It accounts for less than 10% of the whole of the back of the eye. So my job has been to keep that region, and it's a geographical area called the macula, to keep it healthy for the majority of our lives. But one of the biggest problems as we age is a major problem is those cells which are at the very back, which I'll uh, tell you about, which keep healthy or keep the health of those light sensitive cells intact, start to age, start to die, and start to break down. And part of the problem is they break down what is a barrier to the rest of the world. And what happens is blood floods in between those light sensitive cells and the cells which I'll tell you about, which are meant to keep things healthy. As soon as this happens, you get these very bad bleeds only in that area, that very small area known as the macula. But people will lose vision within 12 weeks. Okay, so this is where we started back in 2002. So what can people see when those bleeds start to occur? And here is just a picture taken by an artist and then painted as that person saw themselves. And as you can see, the detail is gone and it's in black and white. It's not in black and white because the artist was being trendy, it's because you lose your color vision. The majority of your color vision is in that very central one millimeter area known as the fovea. And this just shows you what happens if you just encroach on a smaller area of that macula. You still have some detail, but you're starting to lose that real fine detail. So again, patients will describe this distortion of text and there's very simple tests that we can do. It's called an AMSLA grid, 
which is just horizontal and vertical lines. And patients describe these distortions and these graying out. And from these very simple grids, we can tell exactly, not needing a picture, we can tell exactly where the problem's occurring at the back of the eye. Because there's a one-to-one -one association between the topography of the outside world and that map and that vision in the back of the eye. So what you should see on these AMLA grids is just horizontal and vertical lines. If these look the same to you now, then you may already have a problem at the back of your eye. I was joking. <laughs> Got you. Hopefully, you just see horizontal and vertical lines. If these two look the same, see me afterwards. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but that flat picture, which I showed you, doesn't really do justice to the underlying biology. You've got the top layer, which contains all those light-sensitive cells. But underneath that is the carpet of cells that keeps it healthy, known as the RPE. And that underneath that is a huge blood supply called the choroid. It's that middle layer of cells that starts to break down. And it's that group of cells which are essential for keeping the health of the light-sensitive cells. And what happens is the vessels, the blood vessels right at the back, grow through the middle layer, are very leaky, and deposit blood. So our target was that middle layer. Can we restore that middle layer? And we did two surgical operations to answer that question. So this is not stem cells, this is just pure surgery. So I'm only going to tell you one because not a lot of people like surgery, but I'm going to show you some surgery on the eye. So the first one is where we take the top layer, the one that contains all the light sensitive cells, and rotate it away from the diseased area. So on the left here, you see the disease and the top layer are together. We lift the top retina, we move it about 30 degrees away from the diseased underlying layer, the RPE. So the macula is now on non-diseased RPE. <clears throat> that operation takes between two and three hours and you have to go back and counter-rotate the eye, otherwise you'll have the patient basically standing on their heads to view the world. So you have to counter-rotate it, and then you have to go back again, because you actually fill the back of the eye with oil to make sure the retina <coughs> is actually fixed on the back of the eye. This is the operation. I don't know whether you can turn the lights off, because um, you'll see it better. So this is the operation where we're lifting the top layer and we're rotating it literally 30 degrees. Okay? Definitely you don't have a coffee before you do these operations. So you're moving the whole retina around and then fixing it back down with heavy oil. Thanks very much. Avery had this operation. When she came in to the clinic, she couldn't even read the top letter of an eye chart. At the time, and only recently, there wasn't any other therapy, so she would have gone blind within 12 weeks. At now, there are drugs which stop those bleeds, but only three out of 10 of those patients will you get any visual recovery. Seven of those patients, not seven, sorry, six of those patients will get stabilized, and one of them, nothing. They'll go blind. So, what happened after this operation? Avery basically got a driving license back, which is amazing. So... N5. 
sense of breaking new ground by actual experience is still more apparent in the arts, and here it has wider scope and a greater bash basis of reality. Reality. She wouldn't even be able to see the book prior to the operation. She got a driving license back. So I'm not going to be sexist, but if you see a lady who looks like Avery and you're in London, stay on the pavement because she's only got one good eye, which is the good eye we actually operated on. So she has no stereopsis. So she won't. How did she manage to get a driving license back with one eye? I don't know. So. That's the problem. We have an aging population. It's a disease typically over 65, more towards 70. But the population is huge. There's nearly 30% of people over the age of 65 have some form of this disease. And there are two forms. There's that wet form, and it's called wet because you have bleeds. And there's a drier form, which is slower. The wet is accounts for 10%, the dry 90%. So the big difference between the two is the speed at which it occurs. The dry can happen over a period of years, but the wet will be sudden and you go blind within three months. So can we actually do something other than using the patient's surgery in terms of moving the retina because that's not a simple operation and it's not something that could be an outpatient procedure. So can we actually make some RPE, put it into the back of the eye and do it in an operation which is less than an hour? And to give you the answer, yes. But now I'm going to give you the pain which is what we went through. So the disease how are we going to make those eye cells? We need to, in some way, manufacture them. We need to surgically deliver them to the back of the eye. And we have to go through the whole clinical trial process. OK. And clearly, does it work? Right. OK. So as I said, what we're trying to do is replace the cells that are affected and causing the breakdown and the reason for the bleeds. And that's faulty, dying, middle layer RPE. Okay. We don't want to go at a stage where the RPE is damaged and it's been there a long time because then the neural retina, which is the one that contains the light sensitive cells, would have died as well. And equally, the blood supply at the back of the eye would have been um, distorted and uh, in many ways probably trophic as well. So we started this in London in 2005 uh, when I was a much younger individual. And at that time, there was a group just literally a few steps that way who were actually looking at stem cells. And the rest of the talk you can blame that group of individuals, which is Andrews, Peter Andrews, Harry, Zoe, and I don't know whether Jim's here. Um, there was some suggestion he might, but I didn't have Jim, a, a decent picture of Jim to actually be able to show. So anyway, these were the characters I went down and visited and said, what can you do for us? And it was with uh, a um, PhD student of mine Anthony Vugler, in which we started to look at these stem cells. And Harry showed us some stem cells with these little black bits in. And we said, that looks like the cell we want, because the RPE, that middle layer of cells, are pigmented. They're black. So he said, oh, we just thought they were contaminating cultures. We just threw them out. Actually, they were the cell we wanted. And amazingly, what we found was on the right here, we could very easily make the eye cell we wanted, which has got a long name, retinal pigment epithelium, very easily from one particular stem cell line that was in Peter Andrews and Harry's lab, 
which, um, given their imagination, was called Chef One, <laughs> for an obvious reason. Um, and there are two components here which are fairly obvious, as in, what do these cells look like? They're black. That's why your pupil is black. It's a reflection of those cells at the back of your eye. And they have this crazy pavementing shape. Okay, this is a classic. And we want this layer, this carpet of cells in that format. In order to do that, we needed to grow them on a membrane. Okay, we needed to give them an underlay in which we could grow them so that they form these nice, very simple monolayer of cells, which we managed to do. We also had to come up with a surgical tool because we have to go in by the side of the eye to deliver this patch. So we made or designed a surgical tool uh, which carries the patch. So it actually folds it up like a taco shape and then we insert that into the back of the eye. Uh, believe it or not, that too cost as much as a Porsche when we actually started making it. If I had the chance, I'd have the Porsche rather than the tool, but anyway. <laughs> so the great thing was we now had the opportunity to do something in terms of replacing that middle layer of cells, that carpet of cells in these patients. We had RPE, we can make it from embryonic stem cells. We can make a carpet, a patch of RPE. We can put it on these. So what do we need to do in terms of a patient? And I'm just gonna show you again, if you can turn the lights down, the surgery that we performed on the patients. So you have a sac of fluid at the back of your eye called uh, vitreous. We remove that so we can make a retinal detachment. We then put fluid between the top layer and the middle layer and it naturally causes a detachment. So that's the top layer. Okay, it's transparent. We make an incision. And in this case, we weren't using the surgical tool, but it shows you the patch being placed between the top and the middle layer. And then we use uh, gas and air to push that uh, patch of retina back, uh, back onto the back of the eye. So this is um, uh, a diagram of that. So we take the eye out of the orbit and put it on the cheek? No, we don't. <laughs> Take a section on the side. We cause what we call a bleb, which is we put fluid between the top and the middle layer, make an incision and post the patch in and then use gas and air to push it. Okay, 2015 or 2013, we got approval to do our first clinical trial. So, just to remind you, we're putting RPE back, that middle layer, because of these severe bleeds. So first patient, these are the patches. We have to come up with a little carrier for the patch. This is a three by six millimeter patch, carpet of RPE. So we have a facility which allows us to make those patches at the Institute of Ophthalmology in London, which is behind Moorfields Eye Hospital. So we have to get the patch from there to surgery, so in that little holder. So we have to go out the front door, round the side, in through the, the uh, uh, accident emergency, and to the surgery. The regulators have given us eight hours to walk that route. It literally takes 10 minutes. So even I can do it in eight hours in my fit state. But the good thing is just here, you've got the fountain pub. So you can stop off, have a pint, you know, tell them you're gonna eventually bring it to surgery. So here we are. We had a collaboration at the time with Pfizer. 
Well, there's Julie, who now works for Cell Therapy Catapult, and Kate, who was uh, working with us. And then we have Ahmed and Yvonne, who were the clinicians involved in this uh, procedure. So um, uh, they were very happy to unload the uh, uh, patch into surgery. So obviously what we want to know is visual outcome. If you go to an optometrist, then what you see are chart-wise, they'll use the one that you can see here on the right, okay? You know, has the big E at the top. Clinical trials, we have a different chart. And as you can see, it has five letters on each line. And the reason I'm telling you this is when we're reporting vision, in ophthalmology in these trials, we either talk about the number of lines or the number of letters. And what you've got to remember is there's five letters per line. So when these patients came in, they couldn't read the top line. At best, we were hoping to get a three line improvement. We were never expecting to get down to perfect vision again, which is 2020 vision 66, no way. So the first patient was a lady. She could just about read two lines on that uh, chart. We were hoping she would regain three lines of vision, which would be a significant improvement, albeit still uh, an impairment. What she got was a six line improvement, which was quite stunning. But this is lines and single letters. Visually, we don't behave like that. We want to view and scan a lot more. So what we wanted to look at was reading speed because that's much more complex and you need to scan and be able to view a lot more. So pre-transplantation, um, the first patient could just read about a word and a half a minute. And this is how slow it is. Um, I've got to say that this was a presentation I gave recently in the US, okay? So just about read a word and a half a minute. After the operation, she's reading 80 words a minute. Okay, so shout out for Donald. So the second patient Okay, male, and couldn't really even see one line. Okay, at best, we were hoping for a three line improvement. We actually got a five line improvement. So, pre transplantation, couldn't see the book. Post transplantation is reading 50 words a minute. So, this is, um, you know, uh, a major change in terms of visual recovery. These two patients, as I said before, were treatable with the drugs that stopped the bleeds, but they were the one out of 10 in which those drugs failed. So we got the worst patients in that group and got a visual recovery. So the whole issue in terms of a clinical trial is, do you make your primary endpoint, as in what do you think efficaciously would be a gain? And in our case, and with all the patients, it was a three line gain, so 15 letter gain. And after a year, patient one was well above that. But interestingly and importantly, their reading was going from literally zero to 79 words a minute. And in that second patient, equally, they were above the threshold for the primary endpoint and reading, um, uh, actually, that's the wrong one, not 79, but 50 words a minute. But how have they done over this period? That was 2015, that was eight years ago. Here is the two year data and the two are both above that threshold. 
Here's the four year data. And what we see in patient one is a reduction at three years. They had a capsule of steroids in the back of the eye as an immunosuppressant. And in the first patient, it ran out after two years. And it was at three years that they started to decline. So do we actually think the cells are being rejected? We don't, because we can still see the cells. So why, therefore, has a vision changed? We can actually see damage on the patch, which may have been caused surgically. So we don't know. The second patient is still above the line, and even at eight years now is still above the line. They came in about a couple of months ago. So his uh, capsule ran out at three years. So what we have at the time of the surgery was an intact blood supply. We didn't have good RPE and clearly the retina at the time, if we'd gone 12 weeks, would have started to die. So what evidence do we believe that the cells we've put back are doing anything in terms of reconstructing the architecture and the function of that middle layer? And the first one is the blood supply at the back. We can use imaging to show that the blood supply is intact underneath the patch. And this is what this area of perfusion shows you, that underneath the patch, we've got a blood supply, which is gonna support any RPE. The second thing is autofluorescence. Every day when we wake up, the tips of those light sensitive cells shed packages, chemicals, which have been used on the previous day to actually do that photo conversion from light chemical to action. So those chemicals are actually shed at dawn. So every morning when you wake up, you shed those and it's the job of that middle layer of cells to eat them up and get rid of them. In doing that, they become fluorescent under a certain wavelength. And this bright fluorescence here is a 80-year-old RPE, which every morning has been munching away at these um, wasted packages of chemicals. And what you see after six months is that RPE, which has never, never seen any of those packages until we actually put them into the, uh, this person's eye, has started to build up this autofluorescence. And this looks like very young autofluorescence that you see in young adults and then towards an aging. So they're working, they're phagocytosing the outer segments, these packages, and becoming autofluorescence. But equally what is important is where is this person viewing the outside world. And we can use very, uh, what's called microperimetry. We use a way of projecting lights onto very specific areas at the back of the eye and asking basically the patient whether they can see them. And X marks the spot where the patient is viewing the outside world. So it's viewing it right over the patch that we've put into these patients. And we can then use what's called adaptive optics. This is like a Hubble's telescope for ophthalmology, which is we can see individual photoreceptors overlying the patch. So we know that there are cells there which are able to process light. So we can see the actual retina, we can see the cells are starting to function, we can see where the patients are actually seeing. And this is the second patient. The X marks the spot is right in the middle of the patch we've transplanted. So that's where that patient is viewing the outside world and has been viewing it now for nearly eight years. So this is for anyone who's actually in ophthalmology <laughs> rather than general population. But I think even if you're not in ophthalmology, you can probably think this is not good and it's not. The top one shows a big, big fluid sac. 
And this is what happens after we put the patch in. That architecture returns. And in fact, this little dip you see is the fovea. It's that fovea um, uh, component. So this is quite extraordinary that by simply putting RPE back, you can even reconstruct the architecture prior to the bleed. Okay, so what better way to get to the end of this is let someone tell you about what that means. And this is the second patient, Douglas. I will occlude now the left eye. Can you let me Before know? his pioneering stem cell treatment, Douglas Waters was completely blind in his right eye. Now he can see. Everyone wanted to go outside when the rain finally stopped. That's perfect. So this is an amazing improvement, Mr. Waters. I just couldn't believe it. And each morning I pick things out in the bedroom to look out, out in the garden. I do this and it's unbelievable. I've really chuffed, I suppose you could say. And um, again, I showed that in the States and they said chuffed. What does chuffed mean? He's chaved. I went, no, he's not chaved. Chuffed means he's happy. So, um, and that was Douglas who couldn't actually see the book prior to the transplant. Okay, and at eight years, he's still reading. But one of the big things I want to finish with is all these new advanced therapies are going to cost an arm and a leg. You know, we've just heard about sickle cell anemia and gene editing using CRISPR. It's going to cost a million pounds per patient. That's not going to hit the NHS too easily. So what about this then? Well, guess what? It takes 4,000 quid to make the patch and actually put it into a patient, okay? The cost socioeconomically of blindness per person per year is 15K. We can make in one manufacturing run in four months, 25,000 patches, okay? That would be a hundred million cost to the NHS but it's only 5% of the clinical population because these 700,000 patients suffer from AMD in the UK. It's often called Alzheimer's of the eye because we've got huge numbers already, not predicted for 2013, but now. 100 million seems a lot, okay? But those injections that they give are 25,000 pounds for two years. Okay, this is a one-off for 4,000, and it can last at the moment it, somewhere between three and five years. It's a saving of nearly 300 million per year. And if you're going for three years or five years, you're talking that's nearly a billion saving to the NHS. So this is why I believe cell therapies, if priced appropriately, will actually benefit the NHS and its budget, but more importantly, the patients in which we get these long-term survival rates on. So yes, it's a new therapy, but no, it doesn't have to cost you a million quid, apart from when we sell it to the Americans. Anyway, thanks very much. These is all the crew that were involved, as you see. We have a very diverse, uh, appropriate group. They're all uh, female. <laughs> uh, we have an engineering group that are all male. So we have a great diverse. So Lyndon on the left ear was the surgeon who put the patch into the patients. And that's a rather large bottle of champagne that we got very mellowly drunk on. So there you go. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. That was absolutely stunning. Incredible work. Um, are you happy to take a few questions from the floor? No. No. Okay. <laughs> um, if anybody would like to uh, have any questions, have we got some mics there at the back? Uh, while we're setting up that, I'll just ask. So the patients that your first cohort had wet yeah. AMD. Yeah. 
What's the prospect for dry AMD? Because obviously there's far more people with that. Yeah, there is. <clears throat> so we just completed uh, a very early stage clinical trial in dry, which finished in uh, June, July. Mm -hmm. So um, we have uh, a hope that yes, this procedure should be beneficial in certain types of early dry as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Fantastic. Gentleman at the front here. Uh. You have focused on AMD treatment because that's the direction of your research. Is the same procedure applicable to other conditions in addition to AMD? Um, well, I'll throw the question back at you, which is, are there any other particular conditions you're thinking of? I, I'm a lay person, so cannot say it, it, the eye can be damaged in many different ways, and you're the fount of all wisdom. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, the answer is, this will be a treatment for anything that affects the RPE. So in that, um, that includes monogenic diseases, so genetic diseases which affect the RPE, um, or um, there are other conditions, a condition called Stargardt's, where the RPE die as well. So in this particular case, yes, anything where the RPE die and can be replaced. In terms of, is this all we're doing? No. We're also trying to replace the top layer as well, <clears throat> which will then um, help very advanced causes of blindness. And we're also looking at the blood supply at the back, and that would help uh, diseases uh, of the choroid. But it would also, the blood supply, we're, in use, we're doing that because there's another condition called diabetic retinopathy which causes uh, a breakdown in the blood vessels. So that's the biggest cause of blindness in the working population. So we are looking at other cell therapies for different eye conditions, both photoreceptors and vascular type diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Go on, Jace, ask us a question. Uh, ten. Yeah, they're all small initial trials. So, yeah. Uh, gentleman at the back there. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> considering the potential cost savings, how do you take this forward for wider clinical use? Sorry, say that again. Sorry. Considering the potential cost savings, how do you take this forward to wider clinical use? You mean how to get it into the NHS? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. What we need to do is do what's called a pivotal trial. So we're hoping to actually get to that stage in, in two years. So that would be 2025. Um, once that pivotal trial is read out, um, it would allow us then to go to NICE uh, to ask for that assessment to be made. So there's quite a, a regulatory path you have to take. You have to get it licensed and then you have to go for NICE approval if you're wanting it to be available to the NHS. NICE, sorry, NICE is, the, is, <laughs> the name is quite amusing, is called the uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And it's nice that um, say whether it can be used under the NHS um, uh, formula. But we would hope to do that. As you say, you know, the saving could be huge. Right, lady at the front there, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Would, you oh. would you suggest then that uh, it would be more beneficial to those patients that um, have got earlier macular degeneration as opposed to those that have got advanced? So the answer, is, sadly, is yes. So um, if, if, it's just the, if it's just the RPE that we're um, replacing, I'll just, so, repeat, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Okay, sorry. Uh, what I was asking is, um, is it going to be more beneficial to patients who have got earlier macular degeneration as opposed to those that have got more advanced macular degeneration? 
And the answer is yes, basically, because you know what I was trying to show, and I think I think that's where your question comes from. That little diagram where I said, as long as it's just the RPE, then we've got a good chance of regaining vision. If it's advanced, then yeah, the top layer is started to die and the blood supply started to die. So only putting RPE back is not gonna really help you. However, one of the things which, and including in the trial which Jace was asking about, um, one, of, one of the components there were these were patients who had had success with injections but then there was a sudden drop off and the sudden drop off is because the RPE had started to die. So if we can go into those patients again, we can save them early on. But yeah, the earlier you go with the RPE, the better. Could you please say something about the global setting of the work you're doing? There will be others doing comparable yeah, no, work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be useful to summarize. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, it is a global endeavor. Um, I have a position in California, and there's a group there which I run, and there's a separate group which we collaborate with that are also doing trials with uh, stem cells uh, of RPE. Uh, there's a group on the opposite side of the US, on the East Coast, at the National Eye Institute, which are doing some work. Um, there's a, an Israeli group who aren't actually using patches of RPE, but they're just injecting cells. Um, and there's a French group that are looking at uh, using these type of cells for patients that have a genetic disease which causes the RPE to fail. So it is a global um, endeavor. Thank you. Vanessa. Hi, um, you said it's 4,000 for the procedure. What's the actual surgical cost? Is there a lot of training? No, that's in the surgical cost. That, that includes cost. the surgical cost? Yeah, yeah. How are you doing it so cheaply? Because we're good. <laughs> <laughs> because we can, so we only need, it, it sounds like a big number um, to most people, but we only need 100,000 cells. Yes. Okay, yeah. which believe it or not, is a very small amount. When people are talking about doing work on diabetes, they're talking billions of cells. Of course. So we, we only need a very few cells for the therapy. Mm. So that's why we can make 25,000 patches. And literally the cost of those patches is about 500 quid. Goodness. So wow. that's why you can you know, do it for 4,000. Rather than some of the new cell therapies that are coming out that are a million, two million yeah. for the CAR T cells. Yeah. 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 Wow, well, fantastic. So, Hi, I'm, I'm a teacher in Sheffield and uh, I was teaching this uh, principle or this process to some 14, 15 year olds the other day. They found it really interesting. And we had a debate about the manufacturing, the harvesting of the stem cells, whether it's embryonic or whether this is, is it blood cells or body yeah. cells, which you would essentially uh, create uh, stem cells from. Yeah. Um, could, could I ask, in terms of the success rate from embryonic stem cells versus the creation of stem cells in other ways, yep. what's the comparative success rate and which is your preferred method? Okay, so there's, there's two components I've sort of mentioned there. One is, so what's the problem with using embryonic? So there's an ethical issue. This was probably part of the debate you had with, with uh, your students. Um, so these were IVF-derived cells. So these are cells from clinics in which they're no longer used. So it, it's a fertilized egg. That's all it is. It's a blastocyst, okay? So I see that component as just being the same as organ donation, okay? That blastocyst is no longer any use. And in fact, what happens is it will just be thrown away. So then to actually use that for something which stops someone from going blind, I think I have an ethical reason why I think that's fine. So, but that was just to put that in context. In terms of the work which you're talking about, it's called the induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is where literally you can take a piece of your skin and you can literally turn it back into your beginning cell. 
So you can turn back time. So you can take your skin and turn it into a stem cell. Okay. Now, the problem with that is that process, while it turns it back into a beginning cell, has really unpacked a lot of the regulatory processes in making sure the cell is kept safe, i.e. doesn't turn cancerous. Okay, so at the moment, the big debate on the induced pluripotent cells, whether it be blood or skin or whatever, is are they genetically stable? And that's still under question. We do have IPS taken from patients in which we've done that process and we can make RPE. And in fact, we were going to do a clinical trial using IPS. But the IPS trials are tending to go from, you take a piece of sample from a patient, you turn it back into a stem cell, then you turn it into the eye cell, and then you put it back into the patient. That is when it becomes a, an exceptionally expensive process. Because then you are talking, you know, a million quid to do it for one patient. So the advantage with the embryonic is it's completely off the shelf and it serves everyone. Whereas at the moment, the IPS is considered a completely personalized medicine, which would be absolutely not available for the NHS. Thank you. I, I hope that may help you when you go back. Hi, um, I want to ask, how does your approach compare to sort of existing anti-VEGF antibody or anti-VEGF um, gene therapy approaches against wet AMD? So gene therapy can only work before cells die. So if the cell's gone, which is what's happened here, even in the patients with the bleeds, the cells have gone, gene therapy isn't going to work. So then it's the case of the antiangiogenics. The antiangiogenics are only working in, like say, three out of 10 patients. So if we can, as we did, treat these severe cases in which the antiangiogenics doesn't work, then we can actually save the other six or nine um, using a cell therapy. Equally, this is a one-off treatment. With the antiangiogenics, you have to give typically an injection every uh, three months. So it's a repeated um, procedure, whereas this is just a one-off procedure. The other issue is now there's a lot of patients which have been on the antiangiogenics, and there's some evidence to suggest that you stop the bleeds, which is a problem at the time, but the underlying disease is still there, which is the degeneration of the RPE. So eventually the, the wet will turn into dry. So again, eventually they're gonna need some type of cell replacement. Russia. Do you think the RPEs are a relatively early sort of fixed state? Uh, you know, is it a sort of a default state? It's quite intriguing that you, that, that initially Harry and, and Peter saw those cells really just differentiating spontaneously in presumably quite large numbers for them to have actually seen them, and that you can then maintain them and, and, and they don't differentiate further, or at least you haven't really they, they definitely are an early differentiating cell, um, although not all chef lines do go to RPE. So is it just chef one that does that? No, 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 no. The, the, um, I'm trying to think which lines. Uh, chef one was by far the best. Um, I think it was Chef Six um, also gave some RPE. Um, but, but then it's maintained? It's the, all of the Chef Ones do that all the time? Um, no, not all the Chef Ones. Not all the, so, sorry, all the Chef Ones, did you say? So, so yeah. if you keep Chef Ones going, they, they always make the RPE cells? You always yeah. see this? It's quite astonishing. You're, well, we've got a massive bank of uh, Chef. I mean, I think Zoe's here somewhere. Um, yeah, she's at the back there. I think if you wanted to ask Zoe, um, who was uh, a major force, uh, then yeah, I mean it was it was quite staggering that Chef One um, made the RPE. Although the IPS as well, we were quite surprised. It's easy 
as easy to do it with the IPS. So it is obviously some type of very early stage um, cell. Well, fantastic. No, Thank hard. you very much. Um, there would, I, I believe the quenching tray is ready. So if anyone would care to join us for a drink afterwards, uh, there'll be a chance for an informal chat with Pete. So I would like to thank him very much for his contribution Pleasure. tonight. It's been fantastic. Thank you.